Becky in Colorado who wants to know, how do we know if the Gospels are first-hand accounts or not? Hey, Becky, how's it going? Hi. Well, that was fast. I'm first. Um, uh, doing okay. Um, I'm in between um, deism and atheism. It was pretty fast. I'm still working on it, though, because mm -hmm. they, my granddaughter, okay, um, I've just took down this large picture that I had of Passion of the Christ that came from came down from my family for generations. I haven't read a lot of the Bible, but so my granddaughter, she looked at that. I hadn't had a chance to tell her that much about it, but moving things kind of they just make me cry for uh, just at the drop of a hat. So so I started to cry, but I was, and I started to explain it to her. She said, what's wrong with that man is what she said. What's wrong with that man? And so I started to explain it to her and I was very moved and I was like, damn, she's six years old. This is, this is scary. So, so I took it down and I've been thinking about all this stuff ever since. Yeah. She said, what's wrong with that man is what she said. Right. Um, yeah. I'm here. So, yeah, go, uh, go ahead, Jim. So. Yeah, I was, I was getting, uh, that echo was coming from me and I apologize. Yeah. So you've been saying that yeah, but, uh, gospels are like a, t a game of telephone. They're not written by Matt. Ma mm -hmm. uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're not written by those guys. So how do you know that there's all these different authors? And that's that's a good question. And part of the answer is, as we go back to the, the uh, manuscripts that we do have and, and we compare those, and we can see that we have uh, very, very different writing styles, um, word choices and things like that. Um, and we can compare and do... Uh, things like we know that Matthew is like 80, 90% of Mark and where Matthew differs, he is uh, basically uh, correcting Mark. So we know that those two manuscripts are, are almost exactly the same. Um, and so oh, is that really two different ones? But we also know because when we go back to uh, some early church fathers, we see them quote parts of the, the four gospels, but they never refer to them by their name. And in other cases where they're quoting other people, they do quote the name or the author um, of the quote. In this case, the, some of these, these folks are, are anonymous, uh, even to the early church fathers. We don't see a name on any of them until like the second century, um, until much later. And there's some folks who, who are looking at these going, you know, the first sentence of, and I forget which Gospels are off the top of my head, uh, could be the actual title because of the way they're worded. And a scribal error put them as the first sentence rather than uh, the title. So there's a lot of things. But the bottom line is that yeah. we just don't know. I mean, the if, if we're being generous, the earliest Gospels we have go back to you know, 40 or 50, which is pretty much a lifetime back then, pretty close to it, um, considering that the, the apostles were, you know, in their 20s at that point, right? Um, you may, maybe a little bit younger. But you know, we're, what happened in between that, right? We're, we're, people's memories fade. We can go back and talk to people who were at... Woodstock and find that their memories don't exactly coincide with what happened there. We can look at a lot of these issues and memories fade, memories change uh, as people talk about things, memories that aren't there become solidified and things like this. And so even if you grant the early 40, 50 time frame, that's a lot of time, even if those were the real authors, for their memories to be not quite what they should have been. Just simply, and, and I'm not saying anybody is deliberately doing this. I'm just saying this is the way human brains work, right? Um, yeah. So we, they, they may be accurate, but how accurate are they? Um, we also know that people are, are often 
easily misled by common magic tricks. The water and the wine thing is really, really easy to do. Um, you just need a trick picture and you can do it. It's done today. Um, mm. So th that's how, you know, there's a whole lot of cloud around who actually wrote them. There's a whole lot of cloud around how accurate they could possibly be to what actually happened. And then you can look at things like Mark has almost no supernatural elements in it. And John has a whole heck of a lot more. Um, so as time passes, John's generally considered to be later than Mark. Um, you know, the fish, the fish gets bigger in fish stories, right? It goes from being a little tiny thing to a great big thing. And so legend gets added, uh, even by storytellers. So we don't know how it actually does that. Um, uh, you know, how accurate those are. Um, and I know you're, you're talking about how your daughter was asked what's wrong with that beaten and bloody man, uh, and taking it down. That is kind of a, a, uh, we don't we don't like showing that kind of stuff on TV, and yet Christians seem to want to throw that all over the place, right? Um, we don't like we we don't allow TV, you know TV news to show things like that. Why are we doing it uh, just for <laughs> just for Christian just for Christianity, right? It's like it's Christianity just, gets a yeah, pass it's just for that. Something I've had for years, just something mm -hmm. I've had for years, and it never struck me this way. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, and and we don't, right? Uh, we don't see the the torture um, as we don't see torture as being okay. We don't just see torture being displayed as okay. So why all of a sudden do we have that? And what does it really prove? I mean, what 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 is the purpose behind it? I so, yeah, I never before thought about the fact that you know an omniscient God, if we do something wrong needs to be seriously forgiven, why all the, all the uh, rigmarole and I need a sacrifice, That doesn't that make him just like all the gods that need a sacrifice? All the gods throughout uh, history that have needed sacrifices. Be Be Becky, you may I answer the question that you started, uh, you called in for, you know, based on Okay. How I think, how okay. I go. Okay, so you ask, how do we okay. know if the Gospels are first-hand accounts or not, right? So if you look yes. at, this is basically a question that historians usually try to answer, right? So, and if you go look it mm -hmm. up, you will see that they have a very detailed methodology, right? Like they, This is a very good question, and many, many experts have been working for years to try to answer that question in as much detail as possible. And they have been, if you go into, look into their methodologies, you would be so impressed about how much thinking has gone behind this. This The question that you're asking sounds like a you know, simple question, but the answer um, is what academics have been working on for years, right? So the, it's a very important, mm -hmm. it's not just about the Gospels, it's about so many other claims that historical figures have been making, both, you know, kings, emperors, um, other, you know, historians throughout history. How do we know if the things that they're writing are not just made up or is accurate? So there's a science, I mean, to this. There's a, like a methodology to this. Uh, and when you go and study how much work goes into this, you would be, you realize that people just making claims that, oh, this is first-hand account, the Gospels are first-hand account, how, e how easy people just accept that, where, but in, like, in academia, yeah. this is a very serious question that is, you can't just ask, you, you cannot just accept a claim like that without actually going in digging. But, again, I'm not a historian, but based on what I've seen, um, I think having cross-references is, like, very important from other people who have been also um, making similar claims from that era. So for example, if, I don't know, like Julius Caesar goes and writes about his war campaigns or somewhere in somewhere, like we don't, they go and cross-reference that to other people, what they've seen, what they've recorded. That's one thing, but there, that's just one. Like there's many different metrics and there's a very, uh, there's a lot of standards that you have to 
pass for you to be able to for for historians to take your testimony seriously or you seriously as somebody even some people who are serious they know that sometimes they exaggerate sometimes they make up stuff because they're you know they're biased so even people that they know that their record like what they're writing is about something that has actually happened they don't the historians don't just accept all the details that has been written so it's amazing that um without all those standards, just the like Christians would just accept the Gospels as first hand uh, account, right? So if you actually go look at the standards, you will see that the Gospels meet like none of them. But it does, the Gospels do meet the standards of other texts that we know that are made up. Like it does, I mean, just what Jim was talking to you about, it was like the natural progression of, you know, um, you see the evolution of the text. And if you try to, if you try to make sense of this text as some actual people who saw something that and wrote it down, it doesn't fit the framework. The, it doesn't fit, fit this, you know, the criteria for that kind of text. But it does fit, um, you know, it does match other texts that we know in history where people are making up stories and exaggerating it from one year to another and in, like and ma ma making it meet what their are, own political needs. Yeah. What are these what? other texts? Are you talking about from Egyptians or Aztecs or? No, I mean, even in that era, you could see, oh, go ahead, Jim. Jim has wants to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, you're looking at, at the Hellenistic area uh, and Hellenistic Jews, their standards, how they write fiction and how they write uh, things that aren't uh, in how they write history. Um, there are there are things that they did and things that they didn't do for the most part. Um, and the the gospels tend to follow uh, the not historical uh, texts in terms of their the way they're written. And while not all historical texts from that time period have authors, a lot of them do. So that's kind of an interesting interesting little bit. Also that the gospels were pretty much written in what is considered higher educated Greek. And so it seems very, very odd that if this was supposed to be a history, that it's not written that way. Um, also Luke, yeah. the, the first, uh, a couple paragraphs or Luke admits he's putting stories together. So that can't be eyewitness yeah. um, by definition, right? Um, so there's there's some issues there. But yeah, when you start looking at the, the broader spectrum of stuff that was written at the time, um, and you start looking at how the Jewish people were becoming more Hellenized, um, and Romanized in that area. Hellenized? Then it starts, what, does, what does that mean? Um, so, yeah, when you just the adopting uh, aspects of, of Greek and Roman culture uh, to include borrowing stories, um, both religious and secular nature, um, and that just goes beyond dress, but speech and the ways of thinking. Um, there's uh, we don't start to see. This, you know, we talk about a, a motif like the dying and rising God, and that is a, a, a motif in much the same way that uh, science fiction will use. Uh, we got to fix the whatchamacallit with the what's this so that we can go wherever we're going. You know, that's a motif. And so it doesn't point to stories being fictional, but it, it does make it kind of interesting to see how stories change, meld, and, and merge. Uh, through time, and at the time that, that you know, two thousand years ago, when Jesus was supposed to be walking around, the, the Jews were fighting, becoming Hellenized, becoming uh, having Greek aspects of culture invade their own, um, as well as as Roman as well. So, uh, there's some really interesting things when you start looking at the big picture of what's going on in the Middle East at the time, um, in terms of culture yeah. and writing and what was being discussed. So, to, to make this simple. Yeah. So can, you're I make talking, a, can I yeah. make it, make it to make this simple? Like, imagine if you have like a cult or a new sect and a, a new um, sect yeah. of a more dominant religion. Well, let's call it B, right? And this B is now just newly developing. And then there's another couple ones out there. Like, let's say there's another one, another sect that is competing with it, uh, that is called C. 
-hmm. and both BNC are in this environment where there's a there's a dominant culture and a dominant way of storytelling and narratives that is called A, right? And B and C are competing, and B, like let's say it's like Christianity's early days, and you can see that B and C are both are a, like throughout time their texts are their deities or their main guy is becoming more and more um, impressive, right? And this is in an environment where you can yeah. see evidence that they're competing with each other, and then you could also see B's way of storytelling is fitting more and more. With the way that the the dominant culture, like Hellenization, for example, mm -hmm. like the A culture that is dominant, is like fitting that structure, and it's the the way that the stories are being told seems to be for an audience that is more interested in A way A stories, A type stories, right? So if you look at observe all of this, you can like I can I see what's happening here. Like you could come up with an understanding. Like you can see that, of, so this this B the stories that is coming out of B is probably not um, sto a history. It's probably based on when I put everything together, I could see that there's a sect. It's a new sect. It's competing with other sects, and it's trying. The main guy is trying to compete with other sects to show our guy is more impressive than your guy, and it's also trying to <laughs> appeal to a broader audience that likes stories to be told in a method of a. Do you understand? So this is what what's happening it seems like what's happening here if you put everything together does so, that make sense yes it's it's beginning to make sense um so mm -hmm. we're talking about things that happen in the middle east and we're talking then about um christianity jewish also and islam and that's in the middle east so how did it get to England, and then, of course, we know how it went from England to the United States. That's a given. But um, going from m the Middle East to England, that's kind of weird. The Roman, well, the Romans, okay, so the Romans at some point decided to make this the, uh, the religion of their empire, right? Because of a, a power play. And the Romans ruled like they yeah. had all of Europe. And that's how it got from the middle east to england because the romans were ruling over everything including england is that okay. accurate jim okay just a sin. Yeah. yeah 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 stories change by word of mouth um yes. and they they change a lot and storytellers will often change a story to make it more local and therefore more interesting uh to the people they're telling the yes. story to so those are all things that that happen as well but you know, yeah. we, we've been talking for quite a bit, Becky. What, what's going through your head? Yeah. Well, now I'm seeing, uh, I have no idea why this is so cemented that at this point here in the U.S., we can barely read a whole book, and yet we're, we're just taking it on faith. How, how did we get stuck? When did we get stuck in this? Uh, when the pilgrims first came over, years. yeah, I mean, I mean it's not is, just uh, yeah, it's yes. not just the U.S. Cool. As like Armin was saying, it it it's been happening throughout Europe, and and you know, once the Roman emperor uh, took the faith, that's when it really takes off. Um, we see two instances of uh, the Romans creating laws making it punishable by death to not believe. Um, yeah. And the quantity, the quality of the Roman violence is to, you know, at the time was, was unequaled. Um, and so when they spread Roman and that's just kind of the way it happens. And if we don't question as a child, we trust our parents, our parents get proven right many times. And so we'd come to trust our parents as authority figures and knowing what they're talking about and on and on it goes, you know, until someone says, Hey, wait a minute and starts yeah. thinking. Yeah. Do we hardly yeah. have a choice at, at tiny people as tiny people? Um, yes. Um, so. Yeah. 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 And then you have to start asking questions at some point, right? And you start going, but, "Why do I believe uh -huh. this? What, what's the evidence?" This is, by, by the way, Becky, this is how we humans have been mostly deciding what to believe in for the past 10, 12, or even longer, actually no, way longer, uh, thousands, it's been thousands and thousands of years. This is not a new thing. It's only recently 
that there's a good portion of the population who is who is trying to consider maybe questioning um you know faith so if you're if you're surprised like how do we just accept these things and go like this is not a new thing like throughout history this is how we decided to believe things most of us not more than the vast majority of us yeah so um yeah how our mind operates just started noticing yeah. yes Go, go. Anyways, um, Becky, if you don't have any, Jim, I think we should go to other callers. Unless Becky. Oh, sure. I just Becky, do you have any, do you have any other Becky. questions? Becky, one, well, one last thing, um, one last thing. Um, let, let me just tell you one. Becky, wait, wait, Becky, one last thing. If you are concerned about children watching Jesus being tortured, like see, seeing the tortured body of Jesus, if you think that's problematic for children to see, um, when yeah. the concept of hell and teaching that to children is that times a million. Oh, yeah. I think. Yeah. 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 That, All right. Uh, did that you have any other questions for us, Becky? Yes. Did you have any other questions for us? Well, later on, yes, later on, perhaps we can talk about how um, now that we are able to do things like dye our hair in non human colors and and maybe shave it off and put on all kinds of ornaments and whatnot. How mm -hmm. being animals, we do not now look like animals. Is that a given? Um, well, I, I think we're still animals. Whether or not we look like them is is up for debate uh -huh. by putting yeah. various jewelry. Yeah, but and we're, yeah, and changing hair color. Um, yeah. Yeah. you know, animals do things to yeah. make themselves look better to their mates. So we're just, we have yeah. more tools than they do. Yeah. We have way more tools. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. I will let thanks, you Becky. move on then. Okay. All Thank right. You. Thanks, Becky. Bye Thank, you. Thank you, Becky. Right. Thank you.